Hello everyone, today is Thursday, March 23rd, 2017, and this is the week in charts. Obviously, I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we going to talk about? Well, let's continue to talk about this bull market. Yeah, there's a few little chinks in the armor, but I think we're okay, and we'll get to that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks on your stock picks. If you don't mind, and this is for your benefit, one stock pick per line, hit return. You can ask about as many as you want. And then if you don't mind, wait till we get to the charts. That way they won't get buried in the other questions. I'm going to follow up just briefly on IPOs. And then, obviously, we've been having an ongoing uh, series or whatever you want to call it on the hardest, easiest thing you ever do, just simply following along. And often you don't have to do anything for that. And that'll make sense in a minute if, this, if you're new to these shows. And then this week I want to talk about can you be successful with just the basics? That was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading or as often sum it up. All predictions about the future and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. Now, before we hop into the crux of all this other stuff, let's just do a snap crap follow-up. Remember, I've been saying with IPOs, the beauty of IPOs is you can kind of channel Will Rogers. And if they don't go up, just don't buy them, okay? Now, the what I wrote about a couple of weeks ago is, it's been a couple of weeks? Is that it'd be kind of cool if I could just show just a simple little system that could could probably keep you out of trouble and actually be profitable with IPOs. Now, there's some even simpler things that I've done uh, in the IPO course, but I thought it'd be kind of fun to show like, okay, if you had daylight, meaning that the low is greater than the moving average and it's at a new closing high, and then they had an, I added another caveat to there that the high can't be set on day one, which in this case it wasn't. So you would buy Snapchat if it closed up here, and the low was below, I'm sorry, above the moving average. In other words, you had daylight. So, so far that hasn't happened, although it did get a little bit of a, a dead cat bounce yesterday. I know somebody's going to write me, oh, Dave, why do you say dead cat bounce? I was like, well, it's an old Wall Street term, you know. How, could, how come you could beat a dead horse, but you can't talk about a, a dead cat, you know? What if the cat had a really good life and died of old age? It was accidentally dropped, you know? I don't know. Anyway, before I digress too far, too late, a few weeks back, back in early February, I talked about, and I told my peeps too, hey, portfolio not looking so great, but stay the course, because usually that's the thing to do. Not shorter term always, but longer term, that's the thing to do. So my point was that the fat lady hadn't sung just yet. And over the past few weeks, I've been following up with this. Now, again, my intention is not to put new trades in, take old trades out, or trades that stopped out, out, but rather to follow that one snapshot of a portfolio over the next weeks, months, and hopefully, I don't know, I just said hope, but hopefully years, and hopefully, and there's that word again, but hopefully it makes a good example of why staying the course is a thing to do. Now you can see we had a measly $500 profit back in February based on that portfolio from back then. And if you fast forward to today, you can see that, or last night I should say, you can see roughly about a $5,000 gain. Now it was actually much higher than that, I think, late last week, but still, it's still much better than, than $500. So for now, we're just going to say, by Felicia to the fat lady, and I'm going to continue to follow up with this in upcoming weeks. And I was thinking this morning, we probably have a few dead money reports popping out of that portfolio, so I'll uh, make sure I get on that over the next coming weeks, too. Now, based on this week's debacle du jour that came to light on someone losing $4 billion in one stock, and that sort of combined with, I've been watching 
these uh, gurus, and there's really there's kind of one in particular, but I hate to say that because he'll think, oh, you're talking about me, because there's actually more than one. So I just I know I just kind of talked out of both sides of my mouth. But there's been a guru that's been calling a top every freaking week for months. And then now he's like, oh, yeah, you know what? I told you. And we'll get to that. Now, the thing about the debacle in here, and also to some extent this guru calling tops, it really got to think me thinking about this introductory course I'm working on, and it's taken me roughly two years to complete this thing, and I'm still not done yet, so it'll probably be two years total by the time I'm done. But what's taken so long is I am adding more and more to it, as, and that's I'm guilty of that when I write. I end up writing longer than I originally intend, and when I put something out content-wise, I feel like I just got to put more and more and more into it because you need to know this and this and this and this. But what keeps me coming back to this, and I keep kind of adding in a lot of things that are a rehash and the beating of the dead horse, which I'm often guilty of, is because it's so necessary to, to have these basics in mind and trade with these basics in mind and these basics can really keep you out of trouble and I see it all the time from people who should know better who fight trends who trade in less than mediocre conditions who don't honor their stops and the list of bad behaviors goes on and on and I'm kind of jumping to the the end conclusion which we'll get to in a few slides, but the bottom line is get the basics down first and following the basics in and of themselves can keep you out of a lot of trouble. And I think that's why the course is taking me so long is because, yes, I am adding quite a few things in and, yes, I am kind of beating a dead horse, but I feel like I've got to get it, get it right and I've got to make such a good case for starting with the basics and just doing one thing first and getting that right and then building from there. Now I kind of just gave you the whole presentation but let's go ahead and get through it anyway. And the other thing that that I, I just cannot believe is that trading is, is it's not easy obviously but the thing I can't believe is it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. Now I've been there done that got the t-shirt okay I've tried to outsmart the market. I've tried to fight trades. I've tried to trade choppy markets. Just I'm just kind of looking at my bookshelf here. I've got a, a book up there, you know, trading in choppy markets. You know, so I tried a little bit of everything. I think I got that 20 something years ago, thinking that maybe I could trade every kind of market and not just trending markets. But again, trading is not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most try to make it. Beating of the Dead Horse and Arnold, please. Although Kissinger is acceptable. <laughs> I have to work into Arnold. I can't just... I, I think of that... Remember that YouTube I put out there that pissed everybody off <laughs> for some reason? It was it was Daryl Hammond, me imitating Daryl Hammond, imitating Arnold Schwarzenegger on why people aren't more successful. Maybe this does tells into this. I don't know. Maybe I'm just going to digress, but... Uh, it is because of the counting of the wave and the Fibonacci <laughs> and the fighting of the trend and trading when you're angry with your wife. I'm going to keep eating the dead horse. I have to work into that. All right. That's a classic Dave Landry foolery. Now, not to be shot in Friday, but I give you exhibit A of trading is not nearly as hard as people try to make it. So here is a famous hedge fund manager who bought this stock and actually his buy was pretty darn good. Why was it a good buy? Well, it's kind of hard to tell because of the scaling, but trust me, there's a big arrow right here, okay? This market was down towards 100 bucks, and then it rallied up to about 170 bucks, about a 70% gain, at least over that period of time. And he began buying here, okay? Unfortunately, he held on and maybe even piled on for a 4.1 
billion dollar loss. You know, a billion here, a billion there. After a while, it begins to add up, okay? So, yes, hindsight's 2020, and I'll show you some patterns in here that would have got you out of trouble. But simple money management, simple not letting your ego get involved, simple not confusing the issue with facts, all of these things that I, that I will beat over your head as I beat the dead horse in this beginner's course would have avoided such an incredible debacle. I mean, this just baffles me. I can't get this out of my head. I've already written two columns on this, and I'll probably write more. And now I'm doing a webinar. You know, the other thing I've seen recently, and it's been making me bad shit, is that this guru keeps calling a top, and the top, he calls him about a week out. And every time he calls a top, the market goes on to make new highs. And he's been doing this, seems like, and maybe I didn't pay attention before then, but I know it was before the election, or right around the election time. So right around November or something, he started doing this. And then, of course, we had a little sell-off, a little hiccup a couple days ago in the market. And he's like, I told you. But give me a break, okay? First of all, we don't know that that will be the top. And by the way, as a trend follower, as I beat the dead horse, you will be wrong in the end. You will give, some, give up some profits at the end. You won't always look smart. Okay, quite often you won't, hence the name Trend Following Moron. Okay, I was given that name by somebody who was doing what? Fighting the trends, like aforementioned Mr. Ackman. So if you're going to be a guru, then of course predict early and often. And unless somebody is buying your Kool-Aid, you're not going to make any money being a guru. I mean, there's one guy was right 30-something years ago, okay, or 40 years ago now, I guess, and he made a whole career out of that. But he probably never made a dime trading. So don't try to be a hero. Don't try to be a guru. Just follow along. Now, again, trading is not nearly as difficult as most people try to make it. Let's start with the obvious, okay? How do you profit from a trade? How do you make money with a trade? Well, there's only one way to ever make money in a trade, and that is to capture a trend. Now, you might argue, well, what if you sold options? Well, that, that still would be a trend because that option would have decayed a certain way. You're, capturing, you're still capturing a trend, but let's just keep it simple. And then obviously, if you buy, let's say, a stock or any other market for that matter, you have to sell higher than what you bought it for or cover it obviously lower than your shorts. A little bit more advanced lesson there. Cover it, not shorts, but short. But anyway, so your profit obviously is going to be from, from A to B, the difference of B minus A. Okay, I know, Captain Obvious. Well, if you think about it, from A to B is a trend, and that's the only way you could ever make money trading. A lot of comments coming in. Keep them coming. Keep them coming. Now, you're going to need, obviously, three things when it comes to trading. You're going to need a methodology. And, of course, I suggest you keep it simple and start with just the big blue arrows and build. The trend should be obvious, okay? Something as simple as a trend knockout, a persistent pullback, or even better, a combination of a persistent pullback and a trend knockout can really work quite well. And that's another thing with this, this course, and I think that's, that's kind of slowing me down is that I keep having these mild epiphanies. It's kind of like I'm, it's, it's like a, uh, what's a good word for it? It's like therapy for me. It just makes me realize that, wow, 
this simple stuff does work. It can actually work. And don't try to complicate things any further. And that, I keep adding those type of things and, and, and reemphasizing those points. And, you know, and going through the course, it, it's really helped me to, to really think, you know what, it, this stuff does work quite well, even though it's simple. And a lot of times, especially if I'm writing for an institutional magazine, I'm always like, geez, I really hate to just put this simple stuff in here. I'm going to look like an idiot. And then I'm like, you know what, so what? So my last column, I wrote about being a trend-following moron, you know? And I, I thought one or two things would happen. I thought, uh, well, I thought one thing would happen for sure. I thought they would never have me back as a guest writer. And... Uh, and I, I thought through that. I said, well, worst case scenario, I'll just have more free time, okay, because I didn't have time to write the article in the first place. And then to my amazement, they published it, and B, the editor liked it. So anyway, I keep relearning that you need to keep it simple. So something as simple as a persistent pullback, which is simply – the stock tends to go up day after day after day, and mathematically it's equivalent to linear regression, but you could just draw a line and try to intersect as many bars as possible. And if it looks like something like this, then that's a persistent trend, followed by something like a TKO, which is simply a wide range bar against the trend. If you go to videos on my website, not right now, of course, because you're listening to me, but after the webinar, I've got a good video on trading TKOs. The bottom line though is the pattern should be really obvious, especially early in your trading. And again, this is where I beat that dead horse in the course. It should hit you over the head with a halibut. Anybody know the backstory on this? Was she in a hurricane and a, and a halibut came flying by? I forgot what the story is. It just seems hard to believe, but now I know what getting hit over the head with a halibut looks like. I say that quite often. Now, once you get a little bit of experience, you can certainly begin to build and should certainly begin to build. Now, one thing that I said, again, in the course is become successful with just one simple pattern and then move on from there. And um, I use the example of Bruce Lee, who said, I don't fear the man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but I fear the man who has practiced one kick 10,000 times. And Linda Rasky once said, all you need is one pattern to be successful. And that's all in there. In fact, a lot of these animated slides you see pop up in here come from that course. So you, you're getting a flavor for it. And by the way, I do, uh, towards the end, I'll give you some more information on, uh, I, I need some beta testers. And also, if you go to my latest column, which I'll show you in a second, you could actually get the, uh, I'm going to start rolling out the videos. If you want to get a sneak peek on those, I'll be happy to do that for you. But once you get that behind your belt once you get become successful with one pattern by the way and I see this all the time if you're not successful with one pattern what makes you think you'll be successful with 10 there was a blogger a while back and every day he talked about a different pattern and he made it sound like he was trading everybody's pattern in the world and I'm thinking you'll never be consistent doing that so anyway I don't want to digress too far imagine that me digress but the point is, once you get something simple down, then you could build from there and maybe do something like a bow tie, such as this. Okay, this was our one of our longest trades in more recent times. We got in in early 2016 on a bow tie. Energies and metal-related energies were doing well. We bought as the trend began to resume, or the emerging trend, I should say, which is a little bit more advanced pattern as opposed to a persistent pullback, which just looks like this, you know, very obvious, very obvious, followed by TKO, like we just showed. And then we took some partial profits, and then we trailed that stop higher for a long, long time. So the point is that start with something simple and then work your way up as you become successful into something like bow ties and first thrusts and some of these emerging trade patterns. Now, as kind of a buy, by the way, a weekly bow tie would have saved $4 billion 
in the case of Mr. Ackman's trade. That's a weekly bow tie, waiting all the way for the weekly trend to turn, something that we don't do as trend followers, even though, I mean, when we get into trend follow mode, even though we will try to hold on for years, if that stock begins obviously turning on the daily chart and hits our stop, then we get out of the way. But let's say that, that Mr. Ackman waited for a weekly sell signal, and I know hindsight's 2020, but if you're following some sort of system, if you're following some sort of methodology, then you can make a case for foresight in hindsight. So you could see right here that this bow tie would have triggered way back here. His original buys were somewhere in here. You know, so at the worst, he would have scratched out of his original trade. And obviously, he should have trailed the stop higher, used some money management, and got his ego out of the way. Now, I hate to pick on the guy. You know, I don't want to kick him while he's down. But it just makes for such a good example of what not to do and how trading is not nearly as hard as most people try to make it. Now, you're obviously going to need a little money in position management. And I kind of see money management as the tires of trading. Years ago, uh, rest his soul, there was a guy named Sam Baer. And he was a tire salesman to come on TV. And he wouldn't try to tell you how sexy tires was and make them sound exciting. He just told it like it is in a very matter-of-fact sort of fashion. Tires ain't pretty. They don't smell good. But you got to have them, you know. And it's true. You got to have them. I, mean, I put a car into the woods because I didn't listen to a mechanic. I actually told my wife, kind of a long story, endless, but... Got a car, well, I put her to the shop uh, would, to get it checked out or whatever. And, um, you know, mechanics like, you need new tires. We're like, yeah, no worries. We know a guy who owns a tire place. We'll take care of it tomorrow. Well, that night, I put the car into the woods. Anyway, <laughs> like tires, you got to have them. So money management is like tires. It ain't sexy, but you got to have it. Nobody wants to talk about money management. If somebody asked me to do a webinar, I said, oh, I'm doing a money management. They'd hang the click. They'd hang the phone up, right? <laughs> now, the amazing thing about money management, and I know it ain't sexy, but money management will cure a multitude of sins. And this is something that never ceases to amaze me. And again, this is kind of the reoccurring epiphany I'm having and going through this intro course I guess you better not say that too fast it just sounds nasty doesn't it <laughs> I guess I'll just say going through this getting started a trading course how's that now there's a little bit more to it than this but here's the gist of the money management if you get this you got 99 percent of it down okay and again it just amazes me how basic and simple something can be and still be quite robust. So you don't want to risk any more than 2% on any given trade. Obviously, Mr. Ackman did that. You want to have a point where you exit, in other words, a stop, no questions asked. Obviously, Mr. Ackman did not have that. You want to take partial profits when offered and bring your stop to break even. And then, obviously, you want to trail your stop on the remainder in attempt to capture a longer term trend. So you will give it a little room to breathe. So again, and I know my apologies to you guys who know the system already, but obviously we get in, we take that swing trade profit and we kind of stair step to stop higher at this point, okay? And we get our stop up to break even, we take profits. And then once this market begins to move more and more in our favor, we just kind of gradually let this stop open up, often by not doing anything. Right now in that portfolio, we haven't done anything in weeks, okay? And in some cases, the stop has gradually widened out. And then the idea is to ride out a longer-term trend. And yes, in the end, when you do this, okay, what's going to happen in the end? Well, it's going to end badly. You're going to give up some of those open profits. But like Richard Dennis told the original Turtles, he wasn't so worried about you giving up open profits because he knew 
that it came with the territory. He was more concerned about not honoring your stops flat out. Now, getting back to the money manager, manager blah, blah, blah. getting back to the money management, you have to honestly ask yourself where you would be wrong as a trend follower. So let me give you one example of that. And there's quite a few, and I've gone through these in previous webinars, and this is, again, straight from the course. There's about a dozen of them. But this is a really good one that I think would be a pretty good example. Let's say that you're trading a first pullback after a base breakout, which is a pattern I really like because the base can sort of, um, I don't know what the word is, not support, but what happens in a base is you have price equilibrium. And traders usually don't agree for long. So when the market begins to take off, you have a disequilibrium followed by that pullback. But let's say you do get long, even though this is a great pattern to get long, and then that market begins to implode. Well, obviously, if it comes back into the base, it's no longer breaking out, and it's no longer rallying out of a pullback, then you have to admit that you're wrong. i got to work on my trump. Now, I'll give you one more example. Let's say you're trading a bow tie. It says we bow ties. Now, bow ties are a transitional pattern, so they're coming off a major low. So if that market starts dropping down after it triggers, it gets close to that old low. And in some cases, if you want to be a little bit more liberal, nothing wrong with that. Put a stop right below that old low, okay? But if it goes that far down, you're obviously wrong. Looks like we had something. Oh, yeah. I left this in here on purpose. Uh, this is from last week. And what I want to show you here is that it's better to have money management and be willing to give up open gains than to just throw caution to the wind. And if you put these numbers into portfolio without the money management, the 75% loss, I'm just eyeballing, I think it's like 75% loss, versus a 21% and a 9% gain, okay? This really can hurt you. This is actually a good thing, right? So this was a, a stock I showed Traders Expo as a winner, and then uh, somebody pointed out that it subsequently, subsequently imploded, but that's fine, okay? So you can see money management will cure a multitude of sins. I mean, if you start hoping here, where you're definitely wrong. I mean, if you got in here, you rode this all the way up to here, and now you have made a round trip and then then some, you're wrong, and you have to get out. And if you'll notice, going back to Mr. Ackman's trade, he got in here, he rode it up for a fairly sizable gain. I think it was about 60% gain. So he rode it up 60%. And then he wrote it all the way back down 60%. Okay, so if you're getting it here and now you're below where you got in, you're wrong, okay? I, especially after 60% move. Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes you get in and the market might go against you a little bit or bounce around a little bit and then eventually take off. That's okay. But once you're up 60%, you shouldn't give up all of those gains. You'll have to give up some in the end. That just comes with territory. Because if you, if you lock in a 50-60% gain, you'll never make 100% gain or 120% gain. And then if you lock in 120% gain, you'll never make a 240% gain, gain, and so on and so forth. So as I often preach, you can have your cake and eat it too with the money management. If you're risking 2% on a trade and you're taking partial profits, then you only have... 1% risk, at least based on your initial risk profile at risk. And then obviously as that position grows, you will have more money on the line, but you're giving up open profits. And yes, this number was quite a big bit higher up here, and then it stopped out. Now sometimes you just have to be willing to give up, obviously, those open gains because sometimes you might have a steep drawdown like this in price, and then it might turn around and go right back up. I was looking at one a while back. We hung on for about two years, and I'm like, my God, we gave up a tremendous amount of open profit, and then 
I checked back like two years later and the stock had like doubled or tripled from where it was. So it's like, had we given it even more room, and obviously you have to get out of the way at some point, okay, but it's a great testament for the more room you give them, the more likely you already capture that big, big trend. But of course, it's going to suck in the end. Okay. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Joe says, great trader you are. Perry Mason, you are not. Bill Ackman and, and BRX. Imagine a chart full of bow ties. Did I say that out loud? Okay. Sequoia Fund bought it at 17, kept it to 30% fund at 266, sold at 20. Kept it at 30% of fund at 266. So you rode you rode a fund up to 266 from 17? And then you, you didn't round trip it, did you? I acted better than most. How many others could have lost four billion? Yeah, Angelo, you know, we've all been there and done that and got the T-shirt, you know. So that's a pretty amazing thing. And I think that's part of the ego thing, and that's something I've been trying to wrap my head around for years. And every time I meet somebody who's new to trading or just, just doesn't really work to understand markets, they just go off of conventional wisdom or whatever. But for some reason, they think they have to be 100% right. They think they have to sell at what they think is the exact top. Or worse, they think they just have to hold on forever. So, you know, riding something from 17 to 266 and back down to 20 bucks a share, obviously, I mean, I know you won't do that anymore. It's a, that's a hard lesson to learn. It's a tough lesson to learn. But you could certainly trail that stop higher. You know, maybe stop yourself out at 200 when it's at 266. And then if it goes to 400, maybe stop yourself out at 350. You know, so what if you give up a little bit in the end? You don't have to be right. So again, this is the money management as I've talked about quite a bit. And it's very important. Now, obviously, you're going to need to understand a little trading psychology, and that's, that's become the biggest part of this introductory course. And as I said a while back, I think it was two years ago, I, th I thought I would do a, a trading psychology course, and then I ended up with 14 pages of just a to-do list of things that I wanted to cover. So I realized that was going to take me forever. And maybe I'll just crank out a beginner's course real quick. Well, I didn't realize that would take me two years to do. <laughs> so there's a lot to cover when it comes to trading psychology. Now, it's kind of, a, it's kind of weird because you can really boil it down to just a few things. But sometimes you need to know all these different facets of it, all these different aspects, such as the physiological aspects of it. Because that really helps you to, to wrap your head around how it all works, okay? Because there's physiological things that, that make us not be able to trade, that, that make us not made to trade. And then there's a lot of psychological things, as I often say, such as the need to be right, the need to have control, and then the list goes on and on. Things that really help you to function as a human in life from both a physiological level and a psychological level can be detrimental to your trading. So the battle is often from within. And the old Pogo comic comes to mind. We have met the enemy and he is us. I actually ordered this. Uh, you know me, I'm a big fan of symbolism. symbolism. So I actually uh, ordered this uh, comic and I'm gonna get it framed and put it on put it in the wall of my office somewhere to serve as a constant reminder. I got my little airline uh, my little clock here. Let's see if you hear it. So remember I talked about that a couple of weeks ago? I gave Greg Morris a hard time. At least he's speaking to me again. I hope it didn't piss him off too bad. Um but yeah, you know it's like a little there's little psychological things you could do with symbolism, you know, put in your office. I've got a sardine sign to remind me that IPOs are for trading or stocks in general. 
for that matter, we're trading and not eating. In other words, we're not going to hold on through thick and thin like this is some investment that we're going to wait 20 years to come to fruition. We're going to ride the trend and then get out when it ends. And then the little clock thing, a little symbolism there is that Greg Morris used to have a little, he would would face with these adverse situations in a, in a flight simulator, he would wind the clock in order to prevent from doing something stupid like shutting down the wrong engine, the one the engine that wasn't on fire. And then later in his uh, fire pilot career, a commercial airline pilot career, he would uh, metaphorically wind the clock when the stuff hit the fan. So a big fan of symbolism. Didn't mean to digress, imagine that. <laughs> But yeah, I went ahead and got me a, uh, scored me a copy of this, and I'm going to put it on the wall of my office. Now, getting back to the psychology, this is this is what I was alluding to before I went off on my diatribe and got lost. But the point I'm trying to make with psychology is, yeah, it's the biggest part of the course, and then when I do a full course on psychology, it's going to be huge because there's so much that I think needs to be covered. And you never know what piece is going to strike a chord with someone. For instance, I'll give you a case in point. Uh, I was talking with a client a while back who was really struggling. And I said, you know, if you think about it, it's like what Douglas once said, the late, great Mark Douglas. And he said that when you make a trade and you end up with a loss, it's not necessarily that loss in and it of itself. It's like the loss of every trade prior to that. It's like the ghost of trades past. And it's like it, it's this huge feeling, this huge stress that is put upon yourself. You ever, you ever snap at your wife? And it's not that one little thing she did. It's everything that she did that led up to that, that kind of aggravated you. Uh, a better example, in case my wife listens to this, but a better example would be Anyone with millennial children out there will know that occasionally you might snap at them. And it's not that one little tiny thing that they did that's really that big of a deal and you look like a crazy person for snapping. It's every little thing they did that led up to that that made you snap. So the point I'm trying to make, and believe it or not, I do have one, is that I think all these things – need to be covered because I'm never sure what's going to strike a chord with someone. So I want to make sure that everything, again, is covered. So, But if you do have to boil it all down, the good news about trading psychology is that you probably know what you're doing wrong. And as I wrote back in 2016 or 15 or whatever it was, uh, I think it was 2016 because 16 was a little better than 15. I remember asking some people if they wanted to renew the service. And not one person told me that they weren't happy with the service. But they told me things like, I'm not honoring my stops. I'm picking and choosing setups. I'm taking stocks that you show but aren't, aren't direct recommendations in less than ideal conditions when you weren't showing any setups and you suggested not trading. And the list goes on and on. So it's like this big confession time. And Livermore said it the best. And he said it the first, maybe. A stock, spec a stock speculator, easy for me to say, sometimes makes mistakes and knows he is making them. So you may have seen this one before. So you know what you're doing wrong? Well, you know what you're doing wrong. And I love this graphic here. You know, there's your problem. So again, as I said quite a bit, the solution is simple. It's like the old doctor, doctor joke. It hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that, okay? Now, I know that's easier said than done, but if you ever get caught up in doing some serious introspection, just back everything out and say, okay, well, I know what I'm doing wrong. Why am I doing these things wrong? And better yet, instead of asking yourself why you're doing them wrong, just don't do that, okay? Take simple steps to fix that problem. If you're not honoring your stop, 
then there's a bunch of little hacks that I, that I came up with that I thought were pretty cool that I put into the course. But things like if you're not on your stops, then use a hard stop. If you're micromanaging yourself out of trades, then turn off your GD monitors and go for a walk. If you're trading in less than ideal conditions, find something far more interesting to do, as one client pointed out. Now, again, can you be successful with just the basics? I think you can. And at the least, you're going to do better than, than gurus at egotistical money managers. The slide's a little messed up, but that's what it says. So start with one pattern and build. I would recommend persistent pullbacks and ideally combine with TKO. So maybe a combination of those two patterns would probably be the easiest and best thing to do. You want to be a lover, not a fire fighter. Leo Melloman said that. He's talking about trends, okay? And it's hard sometimes. You have to give up your ego to do that. And you want to trade your plan. I'm sorry. You want to plan your trade to trade your plan. I know it's cliche, but most people don't. Most people wing it. The reason they wing it is because the moment you make a plan, and this is another one of my little small epiphanies, the moment you make a plan is the exact moment that you admit you could be wrong because as part of your plan, as part of your plan you have to have a stop in place. So plan your trade and trade your plan. And that's why I'm able to, if somebody, some kid comes to me and wants to beat the pants off of everybody in the class at a stock contest, I mean, I'm two for two. I guess that's not enough to brag about, but... You know, I don't know. I'm batting a thousand percent, right? That's pretty good. But the reason they can win is because I give them something simple to follow, and they just follow it. They don't really care, okay? But once real money is on the line, of course they care. But since it's not, it doesn't matter. Of course you would care, all right? Risk two percent max on each trade. Obviously, four billion dollars. If you lost $4 billion, that fund better be, what, uh, at least $200 billion? I don't know how big it was. And obviously, you didn't have a stop. Don't be a hero. Don't have an ego, okay? Now, channeling Marcellus Wallace, the day of the trade, you might feel a slight sting. That's pride. F-O with you. F pride. Pride only hurts. It never helps. Fight through that. Shh. All right. Well, Marcellus Wallace isn't very good. I need to work on that. All right. Let's take a look at some of these questions, and then we will... A couple of announcements and we'll hop into the charts. If you guys want to start punching in individual stocks now, that's fine. Where's the stop? IPO buying when lows grading. Well, okay, the stop for, let's say you're doing the, um, stop could be outside of normal volatility and can also uh, be, and again, it's something I haven't fully fleshed out, and I don't know if I want to fully flesh it out as a complete system, because I do like to use a little discretion in the trading, but the question is, where would you put your stop? Well, as a, as a general rule, if you needed a rule, let's say that the stock comes public, dips down a little bit, and then uh, begins to take off, and let's say it triggers an entry up here, okay? Well... The first place you could say, look to put a stop would be below the all-time low of the IPO, okay? You know, getting back to wrong, okay? So that's the first place you look. And then you look at the volatility to see maybe I could be, put it up a little, make it a little tighter to not be wrong big, okay? Now, obviously, if this is, is, is fairly far away, then you're trading fewer shares to compensate, okay? So I would start with brand new lows and then maybe work your way up from there. Just like 
I said with the transitional patterns, okay, say you're trading a bow tie off a of low, stock rallies up a little bit, well, and, you know, pulls back or whatever, and then you get in here, if it gets at or near new lows, then it's no longer a transition. So you have to honestly ask yourself, where would you be wrong? And it doesn't have to be rocket science, okay? The, the new lows, if it goes on to make new lows, then you're no longer a trend follower, okay? So you're definitely wrong there, but then work to improve it from there, okay? All right, we'll pull up that one, get to the charts if you like, Howard. He gets in at 173 and goes up over 200 plus 25 percent, takes a round trip. Yeah, I think he was even buying lower than that, huh? I thought it was 60 percent run, but either way, it's still pretty good. Yeah, you know, if if he, if he would have taken, if he were just, yeah, Craig's pointing out, if he would have just followed the simplest of all simple money management, which, by the way, I mean, I just gave it to you here, but it's also in the course, okay? And that says that, hey, we're risking 2%, and then we're going to take a partial profit, okay? So even if we had done that, he still would have made a decent amount of money on the trade. Not me to Sequoia Fund. Oh, a genius got stubbed. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, good, good, good. Yeah, Angelo's point was that he uh, he got stubborn. He got his ego got in the way. The fun he's talking about, which I'm not familiar with, you know, did this, made a round trip like that. Well, that makes me wonder: Did they have any risk control? And like Angelo pointed out, their ego probably got in the way. You know, you look at the average mutual fund, as I pointed out in layman's, in the middle of the year of 2008, when I was writing that book, the average mutual fund was down 50%. The average mutual fund manager was down how much? I'm sorry, the market was down 50%. The average mutual fund manager was down how much? 50%, okay? So market is down here. 50% lower, then obviously they have no risk control, no damage control in place. They're just buying and hoping, okay? Well, buying and hope will work until it don't, just like a lot of other things. James says, become a master of one trade strategy first before progressing to another. Yes, I think he probably said that before. I, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Angela said he retired, in quotes. That's funny. Okay, uh, yeah, keep the stock picks coming. We're getting ready to hop into the charts. Good questions. I continue to work on a learning management system. Let me see if I can find that on my website somewhere to show you. Let's see. Uh, just bear with me one second. And the first thing that I'm going to roll out there is the introduction course, introductory course. And if you want to take a look at the first four videos there, and I'm not sure how many, once I have enough people, I don't know how many enough is, but uh, so if you're, you are definitely interested, I'd do it sooner rather than later. Uh, but if you do want to take a look at the first videos before I start rolling them out, then if you go to my website, hold on one second here. And right now I have it in the, um, I might put it somewhere else uh, in addition. But if you go to my website, and you scroll down the recent content. Now, if this isn't on the home page when you're watching this, which it might not be after I publish this uh, video, just click right here, and it'll be on the next page. But if you come to this um, article here, I'm sorry, I think it's this one, the first one. My bad. If you come to this article here, in the middle of the page, there's a uh, sign up. And I'll send you at least the first four videos to check out. And then once you sign up for this, uh, it's going to bring you to a page and ask you if you want to also be a beta tester. I'm not sure how many I'm going to take in, maybe maybe 20 or so total. We've got about, uh, oh, I don't know how many so far, maybe six. 
So if you're interested to be a beta tester, I'd love to have you. Okay. Let me finish up those announcements really quick and then we'll hop into it. Anyway, it's going to be part of a learning management system, which is pretty cool because the videos are going to be broken into smaller chunks. And in hindsight, they probably could have been even smaller. But at least they're, they're 20 minutes or less. And like right now, it's like, um, I'll give you an example. Like last week, somebody asked me questions about IPOs. And I was like, it's, it's in the course, you know. I, um, can you go watch the course? And they're like, Dave, it's an, you know, each video in the IPO course is like an hour and a half long. Um, you know, ain't nobody got time for that. So at least with this learning management system, and I need to work to get them even smaller. I realize that. But right now, they're about 20 minutes max each, and most of them are about 10 minutes or so. This way, you could chip away at it, and this way, I could also, worst case, I could track the progress and figure out where you are and what you might need to work on a little bit. So I'm, I'm really excited about this. I know I'm a nerd. I don't care. <laughs> uh, make sure you're on the foresight and hindsight service. Some of you are asking me, Dave, when do you ever update that? And the question is, I mean, the answer to that is usually uh, I try to stay no more than a week behind. But lately, we've been having a stock that just won't trigger. And it's an IPO, so it has a bit of a breakout characteristic. So we're, we're giving it some time. And that's why that delayed service is so far behind. And again, as you know, there's a lot of free stuff on the website. All right, let's hop out to the charts. Uh, I want to take a look at the overall market first. And then we'll take a look at um, sectors a little bit. And then, obviously, we'll get to your stock picks. So keep your stock picks coming so we'll have plenty to look at. Let's take a look at the market. Let's start with the P's. And let's look at the micro and work our way out to the macro. Now, obviously, the market tanked a couple days ago, and everybody got all excited. Now, I did happen to watch, I say I ignore the news, but I tell you, this spicy is uh, fun to watch. And when the market was was getting hit fairly hard a couple of days ago, somebody was asking, um, you know, spicy, is, it, is that Trump's fault? Because you, you, you claim Trump, it's a Trump rally. Well, that's the danger with uh, attributing a market to you, okay? And, and I know it's hard not to do. But it's just one bad day, okay? And so far, the big blue arrow still points higher. If we go back to November and measure, let's see, to the peak, that's about a 15% run. In my column, I said 10%. That was wrong. It's like a 15% run from lows. That's nothing to sneeze at in an overall market. If a market does 15% an entire year, that's a pretty good year. Even 10% an entire year is a pretty good year, obviously. So that's 15% since November. And then obviously we had a little correction. And what was that? Was that about percent and a quarter in one day? No big whoop. You know, I wouldn't get too excited about that. And it always amazes me. And I keep saying this, even though I've seen it 10,000 times. You have a big down day like this. Mother of all down days. And then the next day you just have like a pause day. Okay, I mean, that can almost be a trading system in and of itself. You know, wait for the market to have a big adverse move, wait for the pause day, and then buy it. That's probably dangerous. I know, I know I'm always talking about anti-reversion mean trading. You'd probably lose your butt eventually doing that, but I think over the short to intermediate term, it probably would test out. And then, of course, one day, you know, it would work until it don't. But it seems that quite often markets have a sharp sell-off, a bit of a pause day, and then they begin to bounce right back. But the main thing that amazes me, the point I'm trying to get to, is that you have these huge down days like the world is coming to an end and everybody starts freaking out and all the henny pennies of the world. I actually have a chicken named Henny Penny because she's always like, oh, no, 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 no. She's constantly gibbering and, and like she's worried about everything. But it's amazing that all the henny pennies, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, and the next day the market pfft, doesn't do anything. So... As I've said recently, um, channeling Yoda, you know, one day does not the market make, okay? So don't get too excited about one down day. Yeah, it sucks, and if your stops get hit, you got to get out of the way, okay? He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day, but it's just one bad day, okay? 
And if you ever lose sight of things, look at a two-day chart, look at a three-day chart, look at a four-day chart, and then look at a weekly chart if you want. Now, I don't trade off the weekly charts, but it is nice to gain a little perspective, okay? And you can hardly even see the blip on a weekly chart. So that's always a good thing to do. But obviously, honor your stops just in case. Connors. RS12 logic does test out. Yeah, um, that's reversion to the mean now, and, and obviously it'll test out until it don't. So you got to be really careful with. Uh, I don't want to pick on Larry because I know he's done uh, he's done a lot for me, and, but just be careful with that reversion to the mean type of stuff. I hear you though. And I know some people who trade that type of stuff, but they do use stops. So, all right, um, Nasdaq obviously got whacked, and then again, a little bit of a shoulder shrug here. You know, longer term, you take a look at the weekly if you want. Longer term, gain a little perspective. Still looks pretty darn good. Uh, my buddy Phil over there, um, Phil actually told me about Mr. Ackman. Now I can't stop thinking about him. I didn't even realize that happened. But my buddy Phil over in England, I'm sure he's uh he's not just a buddy, he's a client. <laughs> he's probably looking at that 50-day moving average. And so far, we've got nice daylight above that 50-day moving average with the S&P 500. And even if it does correct to the 50-day moving average, that's okay. Sometimes the market will correct down that 50 and keep on keeping on. I mean, take a look at 2013, you know, down to 50, 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 down to 50. <laughs> Looked like it was imploded back here, okay? So, I mean, obviously, this would probably would have knocked you out of your positions, and that's okay. He who fights and runs away lives to fight another day. But so far, we haven't even tagged that 50. So let's not get too excited just yet. Yes, honor your stops. Yes, wait for entries. Yes, be selective, and all those other things that I constantly reach ad nauseum. NASDAQ losing a little steam in here, admittedly, but you know what? It could use a break. Obviously, I'd like markets just to go up forever, but I know that's not reality, okay? Unless it's, we get another 1999. But in reality, it's much more sustainable for market does a little bit more stair stepping higher, goes up, builds a base or a box if you want to call it that, goes up, builds a box, goes up, builds a box, writs and repeat. It gives people time to adjust to the new norm. So I would recommend, uh, not to recommend, but I'd rather a market just kind of creep along as opposed to take off. Taking off is fun, but it's often one and done. So market takes off, that's sound like Jesse Jackson today. <laughs> But the market takes off, and it's great, and it's a lot of fun, but then you get stopped out when it comes right back in. So anyway, NASDAQ looks okay. It's fine with me if it makes a little base in here. Make a little base and then take off in the space. Russell 2000, a little bit different story. It's probing the bottom of its range. and But fortunately, so far, it's bounced back into its range. And then obviously having a pretty good day today. Again, this is a testament, another testament, I should say, if we're not getting too caught up in in a day-to-day -day action. And that looks pretty ugly a couple days ago, admittedly, okay? But it's kind of finding a little support down towards the bottom of its range. And, yes, take a look at the 50. This is also a good determinant of trend. Is the 50 headed higher? Is the 50 headed lower? Is the 50 headed sideways, okay? The slope of the 50 can often keep you out of a lot of trouble, okay? Just like weekly bow ties or even daily bow ties, uh, just paying attention to those could kind of help you wrap your head around where the market is and what it's doing. But again, as I often preach, I should say, indicators are just illustrators. As you can see, this market has gone sideways quite a bit. What's the moving average doing going sideways? Well, just eyeball the market. What's it doing? It's going sideways, okay? Ideally, I like to see this Russell break out the new highs and not look back. Sometimes a market in a range will probe the bottom of its range, shake a few people out, 
and then take off again. That that'll actually test out again. Just because something tests out doesn't mean I want to trade it. Okay. My rooster is crowing. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll be done before the rooster crows three times. Um. As far as the sector action, energies are looking a little dubious in here, so I would avoid the energies. Metals of mining look a little dubious. That might be in part to the fact that uh, the um, the dollar might have something to do with this. Now, the dollar has weakened a little bit uh, as of late, last few days, last week or so. So that could be, um, it could uh, put a cap on the commodity slide. But just be careful. You have to look at everything but don't try to trade everything. So look at that intermarket technical analysis, but don't necessarily try to factor it in uh, to your trading, unless, of course, you have nice setups and everything kind of uh, lines up, all the stars align up. That's okay. Um, most sectors are looking okay in here and have recently just kind of pulled back. That's health services. Manufacturing, losing a little steam in here, but longer term, still in an uptrend. M and C, again, maybe have lost a little steam in here, but not too far from new highs, okay? Uh, media is actually doing okay, believe it or not. It's kind of hard to believe, right? Transports are looking a little dubious, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt for now, okay? I wouldn't rush out a bunch of, buy a bunch of transports based on this action, especially since they haven't made any forward progress on a net net basis since when back here okay most anything technology related still looks okay it's just kind of pulled back at worst recently and then finally let's just take a quick look at bonds the good news about bonds is and again i wouldn't rush out and buy them as i've been pointing out nightly to my peeps but you can't argue with the fact that they are bottoming out a little bit in here, at least for now. So for now, it's not going to be a route. The absolute rate of interest rates, I think, is irrelevant, at least for now. But the delta in rates, the change in rates, I think, could be of concern if we start seeing a big drop in bonds. And that kind of wakes people up when you see that big change in rates even though the absolute rate is 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 negligible if it goes from 0.0001 to 0.00015 that's no big deal who cares right but that the scariness comes in if that's a word when it happens somewhat quickly okay when you see a big price drop on the chart so that's the thing that scares me a little bit with bonds, but for now, I think we may have dodged a bullet or we might have to worry about that some other day. Yes, SBLK was a bit more than a pullback, SBLK. All right, let's go ahead and open it up to these uh, individual shippers. Um, yeah, but if you're long this with a liberal stop, you're probably okay. I'm not sure what you mean about the pullback, uh, Craig. Am I reading that out of context? A little bit more of a pullback. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're saying there. Um, I don't see it as a new setup in and of itself because it did kind of pull back to this prior little uh, rage in here. But these shippers are looking okay. Speaking of shippers, Craig says salt. We are long salt right now. FYI, but I think it looks pretty darn good. Um, it's it's like I said last night, I'd almost prefer a tiny bit more pullback, but then if it pulls back too much, we'd be back to the space. So I think it looks I think it looks okay as a new setup. Now, maybe I'm a little biased because we are long uh, this stock uh, currently, but yeah, I think it looks pretty good. And I've been keeping an eye on these shippers. Maybe I'm hoping for the next dry ships, right, you know? That's what I was telling my people last night. You know, be nice to have an $800 profit in a stock overnight. By the way, if that does happen, sell some of it, please. Sell a little bit, okay? <laughs> uh, but in general, these shippers are looking pretty interesting. And I never thought I'd be a guy who buys shipping stocks, okay? Forget CENX, not meant for this discussion. Now, how can I forget it? 
<laughs> Once you bring it up. Yeah, I mean, this one looked pretty good a while back, obviously, but um, now it's 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 a uh, it's just too many days in the pullback, and then it's pulled back quite a bit. It's almost all the way back to its prior breakout level. So yeah, you have to stay away from that one. Uh, Donald, that one's on today's watch list, so good eye to you, high five to you, but I can't talk about it. Uh, Donald also wants to know about BIVD. BIVD, it sounds like a biotech. Uh, yeah, let's just throw the, the patent and Dave Landry's see the light, daylight system in here. And let's see what would happen with that. Okay, your high was set on the first day of trading, but it also closed at that high. So it would have to take out that high. So your buy would have been here. And I don't know, your stop could be down below the low. That's not too crazy. Okay. So let's let's just take let's talk about the money management on this. Okay. So let's say your buy was at 50, 50. And your stop was, I don't think we have to go below this low, just below this low is fine. Let's say a stop at, uh, uh, let's just say 40, keep around numbers, okay? So you have a profit target of 60, and then I guess you trail that stop up on a one-for-one -one basis. So your stop would have trailed up a little bit in this position. And you'd be at a slight gain, I guess. Where'd you get in? Close was... 48 and change in the high so far has only been 42 no high 40 54 no I'm not quite hadn't quite hit that initial profit target so I can't say oh look at this great trade just yet okay Rick wants to know about BND okay um, in a case like this uh, I would wait for it to clear this range. Now this is a bond fund and look at your uh, HV. It's four. Uh, so obviously I wouldn't rush out and trade. This is a trend follower. I wouldn't get that excited about it. Um, if you were doing some sort of portfolio allocation, then by all means. And it kind of it's kind of goes against conventional wisdom right now that bonds would be going higher. But do wait for it to get out of this range. But yeah, I would never trade that as a as a momentum trader who trades wild and crazy stocks. Hey Donald, you're still on my list. That's actually the setup for today. Congratulations. CHRM. You guys just don't figure it out too much. It's starting to make me nervous. Yeah, this looks fantastic. Uh, it needs a little bit more knockout though, okay? But yeah, this is what you want to look at. This is, uh, you know, where's my halibut? This is kind of like hit you over the head with the halibut. This is a stock that's obviously at a trend, okay? Um, but Fairly thin, so be careful because it is fairly thin, but it's not too, too bad, but it is a little thin. But, yeah, you want a little bit more knockout type of, see this move right here? You want something that looks a little bit more like that, okay? And if memory serves, I think we had this stock as a buy back here because it just was such a beautiful setup. Phil said he'd like to see the IWM over 50. Yeah, me too. Yeah, why not, you know? Um, I hear you, buddy. Yeah, I mean, you know, I never plot the 50-day moving average until the market begins to falter a little bit, simply because it's well watched. Uh, but, yeah, the Russell's trying. You know, I have to admit I've been pretty disappointed with the performance in the Russell. But let's not get too excited. You know, maybe the, the, the brick-and-mortar stocks are going to take the torch and lead the way. And, you know, if you're going to build a wall, you're going to need some brick-and-mortar, right? I don't want to. Confuse issue with facts. CHRM for Brett. CHRM. CHRM. Waiting patiently, Brett. Thank you. It's not coming up. CHRM. One more time. CHRM. Well, let's try again on that one. CY. That's going to be Cypress, right? Yeah, um, Cyprus is at a pretty good trend here. It just needs uh, 
it needs to set up, maybe a pullback. Ideally, I would li I'd like it better if it was past this prior peak in here, but it could certainly set up soon. I'll put it in your watch list for sure. Dave, please look at PLSE, no tie HV, PLSE. Yeah, the HV is a little ridiculous on this. Uh, I mean, I've traded stocks with bigger HVs. Vibe's a little bit low. Um, what's a little bit more scary than the HV is the magnitude of the move. That's 316% over a fairly short period of time. It's going to be hard for this stock to sustain that type of, of move. Some sort of real excitement is going to have to flow into this market and a lot of other buying. Um, so, you know, maybe put it on your momentum list, maybe on the mother, if maybe on the mother of all trend knockouts, okay, never say never, but uh, right now, as of today, I probably would have a hard time trading this one based on the magnitude of that move, okay? Yeah, edit, that was one that was in the service a while back. Um, it took, uh, but it just, it you know, it never did trigger according to the methodology, and then it's like, well, I still like it as a bottoming pattern, but it doesn't necessarily fit the methodology. And that's one thing that, you know, that's your ego problem that you have to deal with sometimes is you're not going to have a be-all, end-all methodology. I mean, somebody else might claim they do, and they're full of stuff, but um, you won't always have that. Sometimes you'll have to let some things go by, okay? Uh, trade review help. Bought it January 3rd at 17.08, January 3rd. 1708. Yeah, I mean, this is back in January. I think I remember saying it looks like a bottoming pattern, but it just wasn't really uh, cut and dry. Back here was actually set up, I think, as a bow tie. But that's not bad. I mean, I could see why you would buy it then, okay? You sold half a 24, congratulations. And you have a mill stop in 1950. That, that, that sounds good to me, okay? He has a question, should I have trailed the stop higher? I feel sick that it's down eight points from its high and now close to my final stop. Well, this will help you This will help you feel much better and no longer feel sick, John. I want you to, to cash out right now and then uh, get that cash. And go ahead and get it in, in the mail as, as cash and uh, send me those preferably small bills, okay? Send them to P.O. Box 298, Abita Springs, Louisiana, 70420. Uh, keep out 100 bucks or whatever massage costs in your neighborhood and uh, go get you a little massage so you can relax and, and, and think about that and not worry about it too much. No, don't beat yourself up. You know, I, I, years ago, one of my uh, epiphanies, which was not much of, I don't know if it's an epiphany, I, for some reason that word stuck in my head today, but... Uh, and an enlightenment for me is when I was bitching because I gave up some open profits on a trade and still made like something ridiculous. Like a, it was just because it was like an options trade. I bought it like for three quarters of a point and sold it for like 27. You know, it was ridiculous. It was stupid. And you know, I was bitching about it. And I saw the trader on, on the phone and he was like, you know, he's like, you're stupid. <laughs> you know, um, you're stupid. Because you made all this money and you're bitching because you, you had like a three-quarter point skid and a thin option. He's like, get over it, you know? So from that point, I was like, I made me realize, you know what? That is crazy. Um, well, up around 28, you know, you might could have bumped that stop up a little bit higher. But this is a pretty crazy stock. So let's say, you know, maybe your stop could have been at 22 or something instead of 1950 where it is now or wherever you just said it was. So don't look at it as giving up eight points of profit, okay? Look at it as, okay, you made a decision, and, and what, did I, what do I always say? Trading is what? Making decisions and then living with them. So you made a decision to give it a lot of wiggle room, and this stock has tremendous HV, so that's no big deal, okay? So what if you get stopped out? You're still going to be stopped out of profit. Now, to help ease your pain a little bit, your stop could have only been possibly two points higher, okay? So don't feel like you're giving up eight points, okay? You're only really giving up about two points from your stop where your stop should have been, okay, or could have been, 
Okay, but there's nothing wrong with keeping a really loose stop on something once it begins to take off like that. The problem is, as I said earlier, is when you have these huge moves, they're not sustainable. And you really don't know where that stop should be because you're going to have a deep retracement. So don't beat yourself up too much. I mean, at the worst, your stop could have been a little bit higher, but not much. OK, so, yeah, just relax, John. Don't feel sick, man. You made money. You know, congratulations. Good job. You should feel great. Go go uh, take the little lady out uh, tonight. Give her a little um, nice dinner or something. You know, good job. They love when you call them a little lady. <laughs> My wife doesn't like jokes as much as she used to. I used to make a lot of jokes, and she's not not too fond of them. Uh, fond of them. Uh, fizz. Uh, now, at first glance, this looks pretty oppressive. But notice that, remember I said earlier, you know, sometimes they take off with a bang, and then they begin to fizzle out, okay? So this is already, it's kind of losing momentum in here. So I'd be a little leery of this one. Um, I'd much rather see a stock pull back instead of drift higher. These drifting patterns kind of scare me. Um, now, if it has the mother of all TKOs, that might wash some people out. No pun intended. But yeah, um, just be leery of that one. Fuel. Yeah, this looks good. This is a um, longer term. This is what I would call Phoenix type of stock, Phoenix-ish, Phoenix okay? Um, yeah, wait for a pullback. I mean, it's not much of a knockout here. Ideally, I like to see it blast higher and then maybe pull back a little bit. But yeah, that's fine. You mixed up the H and R, but I think you covered it. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> uh, another person says fuel fuel generating bow tie weekly. It accelerates more than TKO and daily. Yeah, you know, um, I used to do uh, I used to do a webinar or, or pop into a, whatever you call it, um, and and they would always ask me about. Uh, bow tie they, they'd find weekly bow tie socks ask me about it because they just love that pattern and yeah you know that you're on to something um andre i mean i think that's probably if 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 you for those of you who want to do a little research go in and find weekly bow ties on stocks now the problem is you're going to miss a lot of big moves because they might take off in the daily long before the weekly ever moves but but on the ones that haven't taken off, uh, look for stocks that make weekly bow ties and then figure out where you're going to get in because you could have you could have the mother of all bottoms, and especially in something like this where it becomes a bit of a phoenix stock, okay? And the phoenix, the theory behind something like a phoenix stock like this is that it can return to its old glory, and this is something that I kind of discovered um, independently of Dick Fruth, who wrote a book about uh, parabolic stock trends and, and a lot of this stuff, his patterns are based on these uh, stocks that go down and bottom out for a long, long time. Now, my theory is that this, the company begins to get its act together. Uh, all that supply begins to wash its way through the system. People who owned it like way up at 40 finally sell out of it. They just get sick of it. Uh, death could occur to some of the holders and then the estate settlement sells out the stock. And, and, of course, again, the company could get its act together, too, you know. Yeah, absolutely. You know, look for, you know, you got a major trend turn on a, on a weekly chart. Look for a daily entry. Absolutely. Uh, Craig, that's on, the, that's on today's watch list, but good eye. And uh, ditto for you, Donald. Now, Craig's on the service, so he, he just has to pull it up. <laughs> but, yeah, you too, Donald. You picked it, too. Good job. Hey Dave, CNCE on my watch list. CNCE. Um, well, my problem with this one is it's just got this one huge, huge one-day move here. Let's see if we kind of measure it. So it popped up 60% and then like 7 or 8% if you measure to the high in one day. So that makes me a little leery. Usually I just have to leave it alone when that happens. So I don't know about that, Gary. I'm going to pass. I mean, I hear you. It's it's taken off. It's certainly better than trying to trade something that's going straight down. But 
Um, I would pass based on that that big pop higher. H L N E. Where's the stop? Uh, new lows. I mean, shit. It's only uh. Oh, pardon my French. Sorry. Um. New low. Yeah, stop would be at new brand new lows. I mean, it's only what two points away. So, you know, start at new lows and improve from there, but it's only two points away. Um, now, keep in mind one thing that I like if I am going to trade a an IPO is I like some range. And two points isn't very much range for an IPO, but let's say you did trade that um, pattern. You would be long like right here, I think. Uh, just I have a long. Yeah, you'd be long here, okay? And then your stop would be here. That's only, like I said, again, that's not even two points, is it? Yeah, it's like one point and change. So it's just, just I would like to see a little bit more range before uh, going after something like this. And it's a brokerage. I don't know. Maybe a brokerage aren't that exciting, you know, so maybe wait for a secondary setup. Jim Freeman, TTPH. TTPH. Yeah, that looks good, uh, Jim. Good job. Uh, let's take a look at, let's clean up this chart a little bit. Um, yeah, absolutely. On a knockout, I mean, this needs to be in your watch list. Uh, I hope it's in mine. If not, I'm going to be bummed out. Let's see. No, it's not in my watch list. Well, I'll add it tonight. Or is it? Let's see. Nope. All right. Well, you gave me one. I would have seen it tonight. Don't worry. Yeah, on a pullback though, okay. Oh, you're long at five five two? Wow. Would you get long on a bow tie or something? Cool. Yeah, nice work. a uh, little overhead supply back here, but who cares? Wow. Good job. Now in the end, when it pulls back and you give up some of those open profits and you, you start feeling bad about that, just send me the money, you know, and, and you'll feel much better. I promise you. <laughs> no, good job, Jim. Maybe it's because you tell her the same jokes. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I used to call a little lady in these uh, presentations just being silly. And now she told me to stop. Rick says, see, uh, this is a shipping ETF. Um, well, first of all, HV is a little low. Uh, I would go after individual issues uh, here because you've got some, it's kind of sideways too. I Let it break out and then maybe play pullbacks, but that, that might not be a bad play once it breaks out. But, you know, you got something that looks like salt, um, which has already broken out and pulled back and now rallying up the trigger. Go for salt versus the ETF for now. James has been waiting patiently for Netflix, NFLX. A couple of you guys are asking about that for some reason. Uh, Netflix is a big, thick stock, and um, it can be a little wide and loose. I mean, I know it trends on occasion, but for the most part, it's kind of wide and loose. And in this particular case, just look at your net net change. Somebody asked me how I did this. It's just a C key. And if you – I don't want to turn this into a telechart lesson, but – if you just go to Telechart and Google, or just Google hot keys for Telechart, it'll give you these things, just like I draw a trend line by hitting my D key, which somebody actually emailed me, told me to do. Uh, so, yeah, avoid that, James. It's too sideways. NLNK for Donald. Okay, we kind of got a lightning round. NLNK. Yeah, we'll talk about that next, Chris. We'll talk about race. Yeah, this looks pretty good. I'd actually like to see a little bit more knockout. I mean, it did kind of have that drifting pattern here, but a knockout will kind of uh, cleanse the pallet on that one. Uh, but, yeah, it looks pretty good. You have some overhead supply up here, but it's a ways back. And you know what? If I got in and it went up to $35 a share, I, I wouldn't complain. Uh, yeah, a little bit more pullback. Put that on your uh, momentum list. Hey, look, it's on my momentum list. You guys look at my list? That's how you get in these stocks, huh? No, just kidding. Race. Yeah, I was looking at race. That's Ferrari. Um, what's kind of cool about this one is that, uh, you know, this was a great example of, of why you don't buy IPOs straight out the gate. You know, look what it did. Um, just for S&Gs, the other night I was looking at uh, what would happen if you put the five-day system into this thing. Okay. 
And because the, the high was set on day one, you wouldn't have triggered into it until right there. Isn't that crazy? I mean, that's just... So it has a long-term characteristic to it, too, which I just think is cool. I'm sorry. I'm a nerd. You know, maybe I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid. But look at that. That's just awesome, okay? They got their act together, okay? This is what I call the die and the fly. Uh, sometimes you just come out and die, okay? And that's why you don't want to rush out and buy an IPO. Let them die, and then when they begin to fly, then think about getting on. So, yeah, put it in your momentum list on pullbacks, absolutely. Swear, S-W-I-R, I swear, I swear I never traded that stock. Um, yeah, let it keep breaking out. I mean, it's just a huge gap here, but maybe that's okay. Let's see what happens. Uh, let's see if it keeps following through and then maybe pullbacks. SXCP, SXCP, uh, no, no, it's, it's uh, obviously dropping, so leave that one alone, I got to be careful, because sometimes people's like, you never like my stocks, it's like, well, if you're new to the program, we like to trade trends, and this looks like the trend has ended there, TGB, TGB I like. I'm actually long this one, uh, I think. Uh, I'm pretty sure I'm long it. Um, I don't know where my stop is off the top of my head, though. Uh, even though I'm I'm fan of it because I'm long, I've already taken profits. I'm in longer-term trend following mode. Um, I, would, I would not go after this new setup unless it made new highs and then pull back again, okay? But, yeah, have a stop in mind on that one. I don't know if I have a hard stop in or not. I put some stops in this morning. I don't remember what I did. The challenge is to balance the time between weekly and daily entries. Yeah, no, I hear you. Uh, I hear you. The, with the, but the only problem with that is you're going to miss a lot of setups if you're waiting for just that weekly setup. But if the setup is already there to begin with, like the stock we were looking at a little while ago, then by all means, try to time that daily entry to get to get in early. I'll get in as that trend continues. Absolutely. Gary says, I kept watching the video from the low 40s and never bought where, in hindsight, should I have bought? Where should I have bought? Well, I don't watch individual stocks over and over and over again. I mean, I do have this momentum list, but I, I couldn't tell you what's uh, what's in it at 40. Um, well, you know, keep in mind, you never, sometimes you just don't get a clean entry uh, or clean setup. So don't beat yourself self up about that. You can't kiss all the women. I mean, nothing's really jumping out at me in here. Maybe back here, just pull back. But still, it's not, um, you know, sometimes they're not that clean. And sometimes these big, thick stocks like this aren't going to really be clean when you're trading the momentum. So you just have to go with the flow. Yeah, don't beat yourself up because you missed one. You know what? There's like 3,000 stocks out there, 2,000 stocks that are tradable. TTD from a few of you guys asking about that. Yeah, I like this one. Oops, sorry. That's that's the trade of the day. <laughs> Who are you in the service? Who asked me? Who is Jim? Are you in the service? You know better than that. You you slipped that in there on me. I'm sorry, guys. Who are in the service? Yeah, that's the setup for today. Maybe I won't uh, post the uh, the live video until it uh until it triggers. You got me, huh? Are you in the service? <laughs> Did you front run this? Better not have. It's okay. You could front run them if you want. I can't front run them, but you can. Just don't bring them up in the, in the show once you did. I mean, if it's on the service. I don't care if you buy something and bring it up. I mean, some people get all upset. I don't let, I don't let people ask about stocks in the show because I know, I know they're already long. I was like, well, so what? You know? <laughs> We can make fun of them if it's a bad trade, right? Yeah, this looks okay. Uh, I'd almost like to see a little bit more breakout followed by a pullback, but absolutely, I should be on your momentum list. And look, hey, look, Big Dave's got his momentum list down here. Uh, V-Ray. Uh, yeah, that's another one that you could go ahead and put on your momentum list. Uh, HV's a little crazy, though, 118. But, yeah, it looks kind of interesting. Let's back the chart out a little bit, see what we got. Yeah, it's kind of, I don't know what's going on back here. But it looks like it's uh, getting its act together, starting to uh, starting trend. All right, we've got time for one more, and then I'll have to wrap things up. Anyone? 
While we're at an impasse, I obviously want to thank everybody for coming today. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. I love doing these shows, as you can tell. And uh, I'm humbled that you show up. You're welcome, Harold. You're welcome, Craig. Uh, all right, one last one. No, Craig, that's on the list. That's on the watch list for today, so we can't go that. Anyway, uh, everybody have a great weekend. If we don't talk again, Chris, email me on that one. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, an email if you like. And uh, anything unanswered, shoot me an email, daviddavelander.com. If I don't have time to get to your email, like individual stock picks, for instance, then we'll cover it next week. I know it might be a little timely, but um, any questions requiring a lot of thought, too, I'll be happy to cover it uh, in next week's show. If we don't talk to you now and then, again, everybody have a great weekend. I guess we'll talk again uh, next Thursday. Thank you so much. You're welcome, guys.